All right, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay. Yes, today, today we are going to be covering troubleshooting in general. Not well, not in general. Let me rephrase that. We're going to dive into exercises. So that was a huge kind of popular thing from a few weeks ago. We did some troubleshooting exercises, and even from the cooling tower side, uh, I'm seeing that y'all are really uh, expressing to get a lot of benefit from that. So today, specifically, we're going to be taking that a step further. So I'm going to, I meant to just, you know, my usual last minute preps on stuff, but we're going to draw a basic system here. I'm going to lay out some general parameters. And then from there, we will, uh, we'll start getting everything lined out, making sure my audio is coming through. Okay. So we're going to make this our compressor coming out of the compressor. We have a really hot pipe coming out. Going into our condenser coil. Coming out of there, we have a less hot pipe. We're gonna call it brown. That comes over to TXV. All of these are going to be TXV, by the way. And coming out of there, we'll just go straight blue. We have our evaporator. Back into suction. Okay, and all these are going to be based around a um, a 100 degree ambient outside. So that's going to stay consistent. Uh, OAT, OAT. Okay, uh, 100 is easy round number for me to remember, and we're dealing with one, with triple digits right now, so it seems appropriate. Uh, okay, so next we need to figure out, we're going to dive into our first troubleshooting scenario. So the first one I've got queued up for you here. The complaint is it is humid in the space. I want to give you some baseline readings to begin with, and then you can start plugging in uh, or start making your suggestions. So as uh, this is where the comments feed is going to be real critical here. So as I'm giving parameters and lining things out, if you want to know more than I'm giving, Feel free to ask if you have recommendations. The goal of this is to talk about the troubleshooting process and think about it from a, a higher level perspective and try to help you work through some probable causes, some common issues that we deal with, and just that troubleshoot process. That is our ultimate objective here. So our uh, SAT and SH over here. It is going to be on this first one, uh, 50 and two. So our saturation is 50, our superheat is two. On our discharge side, we're gonna have a sat and subcool, which will be 130 and 20. Okay, now we're not going to stop there. On our air side, we've got a return of 75. Uh, when am I going to draw this? I'm going to draw it over here. Uh, RA is 75, supply is 55. But our relative is 70 percent. Reminder, the complaint, the service call came in as it is humid in this space. Given these parameters, oh, I forgot one. Given these parameters, what are the probable causes? One that I did not include is our discharge superheat. So our discharge superheat uh, to try to follow my format here. This SH is 10 degrees. All this is in Fahrenheit, in case you were wondering. All right, what do you think? What are your suggestions? What could be possible causes? Okay, we've got one vote for overcharge. Any other votes? Everybody agree? Anybody disagree? If you disagree, why would you disagree? Granted, I do 
understand this is kind of a very chat format, so maybe not the most convenient thing trying to type it all out, but just on a high level, what is it overcharge? Do you have an opinion as to why? So, uh, Michael, why do you think it's overcharged? What specifically is keying out to you? Because when you get into a system like this, okay, so you've taken your basic readings, you've got as an essential analysis of what's happening. You've got to start deciding, okay, we've got all these possible parameter or not, uh, diagnosis that it could be. So out of everything that it could be, what is it or why is it not those other things? So for me, I found it's easier, instead of taking an approach of, okay, what is it? It's, I find that I like to take the approach of what is it not? So, um, you know, we've got a really high relative humidity that's really standing out to me. But for overall, it seems like we're maintaining the space and load okay. So that seems weird. Now, something's weird going on here on our suction side and 20 degrees subcool seems a little excessive. Do I have a high efficiency system? Is it just a regular everyday Joe Blow system? You know, what's going on with that? Uh, this particular one, I would say is just a standard regular uh, air conditioning, nothing fancy. Uh, so we've got another one for fan speed is too high. Okay, uh, we'll talk about that. And flooding the EVAP, high condenser saturation, low superheat, high subcool. Okay, uh, that's valid points. So I'm gonna start with the fan speed is too high. If we were dealing with a high fan speed, we're talking about over on the evaporator side, what would a higher fan speed do? So at that point, we're moving more total heat across the coil. So the more air we're moving, the, the faster it's going, um, the more it's going to put into the coil. So having a 50 degree saturation with a standard sear, this is nothing fancy, nothing high efficiency. So that would make a lot of sense. We could definitely say, and we also know that if we move more air, then we're, we're taking out less humidity because the air has less contact time. So all of that makes complete sense, except there's another variable that comes in when you start dealing with, uh, with high airflow. And usually, if you're adding more heat to the system, now the, the TXV ought to be able to do its job, but in, ultimately, you're gonna run a higher superheat than you would typically run if it was just a, then it would be if the airflow was, say, correct, if you will. Let's say it was the needed to be on a medium speed for this house and or this this job site, and for some reason it was on high, okay? I would expect a high superheat or higher than normal. So if that TXV does a pretty good job keeping it between, say, 8 and 12, well, then I would expect my superheat to lean more towards the 12 side than the 8 side, if that makes any sense. What else do we have coming through here? Uh, compressor amps, high or low? Um, this particular case, they would be high. You should have high -er compressor amps. Yes, higher compressor amps. Um, any other suggestions? So, uh, see. Good delta, although high fan speed should give a low delta. Uh, low superheat, high scub cool makes me think restriction somewhere else. Okay, so check the bulb. Okay, good suggestions. Low superheat and high sub cool uh, make, making us think a restriction somewhere. So, all right, so say we got a restriction. Let's hone in on that, because that's the thing. Lots of ideas in your head, right? Honestly, the way most of us work, this chat feed isn't much different than our own voices in our mind. So it's gonna go fast, it's gonna be rapid, and we're, we've got all these ideas of what it could be a lot of the time. You gotta pick one, focus on it, see it through, eliminate it, move to the next. It's really all you can do. You will just overwhelm yourself, and you're gonna spin your wheels. And if you don't see each one of these through and verifying it's not this, it's not that, then you're not gonna actually allow yourself to work into what the actual problem is. So going back to where I was, I've already forgotten. Low superheat, uh, the restriction, that's right. So if we had a restriction somewhere, okay, let's troubleshoot restriction on either side. 
let's say we had a restriction at the high side, let's say it was the filter dryer, which I did not depict here. So say it was a filter dryer, we're taking our line reading before the filter dryer. So that would make some sense here. We have a elevated saturation. We have a 20 degree subcool. And if our other side of our dryer was significantly cooler in terms of line temperature, so 20, 30, that would make it 110 on this side of the filter dryer. I want to actually just draw that and depict it. Let's say our filter dryer is right here. Okay. So let's say on this side of the dryer was 110 and this side is 100. All right, pretty clear indication is more than our three degrees that we typically allow. We got a bad dryer, right? Um, but, but, okay. So we, we might have something with this one. If we continue that logic through, if we've got 100 degrees here, that means that this dryer, this dryer is dropping our system pressure and is probably not feeding true liquid to our metering valve, which would also mean that we would technically starve our metering device. And if our metering device, especially a TXV, is getting starved, it's going to starve our evaporator. Do these readings suggest a starved evaporator? Ultimately, no, for two reasons. Our saturation is elevated, so I would expect this to be lower, you know, down 30s, 20s, something lower, and our superheat would struggle. So being the fact we have a high saturation and a low superheat would indicate to me that we're putting too much refrigerant into the coil, not too little, and that would eliminate this restriction or this restriction from the equation for me. Well, let's say it was a restriction on the low side. Um, so let's say it had a, a, a suction line filter dryer that somebody put in to clean out a burnout at some point and they never took back out. Uh, more than likely, you would be taking your readings after the filter dryer because uh, typically it's going to be somewhere up in here and your point of measurement is going to be down here closer to the compressor. But let's say for some reason that wasn't the case. Uh, let's say somehow we took a reading before that dryer. These readings could make more sense because if we've got a, a suction dryer that's not allowing refrigerant to pass through, on the other side of that dryer, we're actually starving that compressor quite heavily, but our evaporator may be full of refrigerant, which would indicate our two numbers here. But there's something else we can use to eliminate even a suction dryer. That's our discharge superheat. So our discharge superheat is only 10 degrees. That is low, even for a scroll, uh, or especially for a scroll, I should say. Those tend to run higher. So uh, 10 degrees is not enough given our conditions. So even so what, one of the biggest things that affects my superheat is going to be my subcool or my, my soup she was one of the things that's going to affect my discharge superheat is going to be my evaporator superheat. So being the fact that I have a really low evaporator superheat means that my suction cooled compressor, is gonna be very heavily cooled by only two degrees of superheat, which also means that it's probably gonna have some occasional liquid flood back. In that condition, that would make sense on my uh, 10 degrees of discharge uh, superheat. If I had a dryer here that was restricted, this would force my discharge superheat to be significantly higher, which would eliminate the uh, the concept of a low or I'm sorry a uh, restricted line in the suction side. So needless to say, my conclusion is I can eliminate, based off of my uh, readings, a restriction at this point. Now the other thought was, if it was in the maybe the metering device had lost part of its charge, or if something had happened to the bulb, maybe it wasn't mounted properly, which is true, but Let's work through that. Okay, let's say it had either come off the pipe where it wasn't able to read properly up here on the suction line. I don't know why I'm showing you down here. 
So let's say it, it wasn't reading properly and um, let's start with it lost its charge. Okay, we gotta pick one because we got two options. Either it's, it's lost its charge or there's something wrong with its mounting. Let's start with it lost its charge. So when that valve loses its charge, that means that the counter pressure on the, um, the adjustment uh, uh, pins inside of the valve body aren't gonna have that counter pressure. So the only pressure that left in, the, in that valve's body is the spring pressure pushing back up along with the system pressure. So that alone, short of our discharge pressure pushing in and forcing it down, is going to cause us to shut the valve, essentially. Kind of coming back to restriction mindset, we have these two readings would indicate to us we have a lot of refrigerant in that coil, not too little. So I could eliminate the possibility of maybe a bulb issue. Let's say the bulb wasn't attached then. So the other side of that factor would be, okay, then I would be overfeeding because my I'm reading air, which is 55. Well, okay, so I can talk myself out of this one. I'm reading, say, 55 here because this is going to read, you know, give or take supply air. So let's say this bulb thinks it's seeing 55 to 60 degrees once you actually calculate the mixed air. Um, so it's trying to maintain 10. It could be thinking it's sitting somewhere around that spot. So it's, so it ultimately it's going to feed heavier because it's not, it's not measuring the suction line properly. So that because the valve isn't reading properly, it, it's, and it's not taking a proper pipe temp, then yes, these two readings could make sense because we're showing we're overfeeding. We don't, we're not maintaining low enough uh, superheat because it can't read the pipe right. And we've got a whole lot of refrigerant in that coil forcing our saturation up. But what would happen on a high side? Because they're going to be a chain reaction of each other. So if this valve is open too much and allowing too much flow through, but we don't actually have the load in the building, we've only got a 75 return, we do have a 70% 70, 70 relative humidity. Um, we would end up running our subcooling uh, lower because the velocity through the system would end up increasing and being higher. We'd get more of total volume, which wouldn't give us time in the coil to accumulate 20 degrees worth of subcooling because we're flowing it through there so quickly. So it's the opposite of a restriction where everything backs up. In this particular case, we're draining too fast. So a high subcooling value, even a high condenser saturation in this case, could be used to negate an overfeeding valve. Now the valve is overfeeding, that is true, but we do not have enough to condemn the valve so let's say, okay, you thought you went through this whole process and it's a very plausible theory, something is wrong with the bulb. So you just go check it, you go look at it. The bulb's mounted properly and the bulb is insulated properly. Both are true. Then you can eliminate the mechanical aspect of that, of the bulb being your issue. Okay, uh, overfeeding TXV, little overcharge, let me, Come back up to see. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Well, no, uh, that's so, Wes, that's not necessarily true uh, because a restriction on the filter dryer, uh, you're going to see it on the high side, but it's also going to mean that you're starving refrigerant to your to your low side of the system if you've got a proper charge. So I would expect to make the low side, you know, in, in a more extreme case, in a, in a less extreme, you are correct, but in a more extreme scenario, kind of like what we have here, um, 
I would I would expect to, to see like low charge type symptoms on the on the low side as well. Again, these are all expect to see. This is all just me going off of conditions and things that I've seen in the field. And, you know, we've talked about here as good examples of just stuff we've ran into, some numbers we've seen. None of these are hard numbers we've pulled off of a specific job. So I can preface with that pretty safely. Uh, overfeeding, overfeeding TXV, a little overcharge, all right. Bulb could be mounted improperly or fell off. Uh, do we have good airflow on the EVAP? Uh, I would venture to say, being the fact we've got a pretty decent, well, one, we're controlling space temperature and our saturation is uh, elevated where it is. I think we've, we've at minimum got enough air. And if anything, you know, you would end up arguing the case of not enough or too much, arguing the case of too much air. All right, uh, see, 20 degree delta means airflow is close to proper. There you go, Michael, good job. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, all right, Jason is lost. Yes, Michael, you're on that. Uh, yeah, why are you lost? And, and, that's, and that's okay, it's okay to be lost, right? Keep that in mind. Uh, we don't this, this can get real complicated real fast. And I've said a whole lot of words on just this one particular problem. So let's talk about it. That's the whole point of this structure. Now, if it's not been obvious, one answer I've been blatantly ignoring is uh, the overcharge example. So ultimately, that would be uh, my personal diagnosis is I would come into this system. I've got an elevated saturation. I've got a elevated subcooling. I have no drop across my dryer. It is proper. I'm not removing enough humidity, but I see that I have an elevated saturation. This system normally may run around 40 degrees of saturation, and instead I'm running 50. So that's a lot of relative humidity that I'm not taking out of the space. In addition to that, I'm overcharged far enough that my TXV can't control the superheat anymore. So I'm putting so much refrigerant in, which is then reflected by, I'm getting too cold of gas back to my compressor with a load. Like this would be these numbers here. And even with this, like this indicates to me, I've got a full load on this compressor. I would absolutely expect this superheat to be somewhere between minimum 20 degrees up to around 40 degrees, right? Somewhere in there would make complete sense with a load in 100 degrees outside of ambient. Like that's with the charge being correct. So being the fact that this is this low and I've got a low superheat, but my complaint was humidity. So ultimately the system is cooling and it's not tripping. It's not having any other symptoms, it's cooling the complaint was, it's just really uncomfortable. It's humid, it's sticky. I've got a thing on my desk that tells me what the humidity and temperature is and it doesn't say what I want it to. Whatever that complaint, or whatever version of that complaint comes through, ultimately the humidity is what they're complaining about. And somebody having overcharged this forced our evaporator saturation so high that we could no longer process that humidity correctly. So you take a couple of pounds out of the system and you start to see everything normalize. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me catch up. Uh, what is the heater? It's what if the heater is also running with the cooling on. Uh, oh, that's actually, well, that's a fantastic point. I actually had that call that very call, uh, end of last year? I'm pretty sure, yeah, pretty sure the end of last year. Yeah, the thermostat had failed internally, and so it was, the W1 was stuck on to where it was constantly calling, but the, um, uh, uh, but it was just trying to cool, so yeah, anyway. We wouldn't see our supplier temperature get down, and, that, comp that complaint wouldn't be a humidity issue because if anything, 
if anything, if the heaters are stuck on, we've turned our air handler into a dehumidifier. And now we're reintroducing basically neutral air back into the space because as the coil is processing it out, um, our heater is then just taking that 55 degrees and turning it back into 70, 75, whatever, uh, to put back into the house. So at that case, my expectation would be, you know, your, your relative humidity may be the opposite. Instead of being high, it may be really low uh, or something of that nature. You know, that, that heater is, is counteracting all the cooling we're putting on the system, but the dehumidification is still taking place. We're only trading off the sensible. If hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I have a question here from Robbie. Uh, discharge super heat. Where would you take the measurement? Oh, uh, take the measurements within six inches of the discharge of the compressor. That is what's recommended. Now, obviously, that's not always feasible. I'm going to put this in here because if you can get to it and if that's something you can realistically do in your situation, it is a very useful. Oh, no. How are we back? Can you hear me yet? Can you hear me yet? Oh. There we go. You know, it's ridiculous. I'm using a completely different camera this time uh, because I was dropping out last time with the other camera and I just decided I wasn't going to trust it anymore. And now I'm realizing there's a setting in these things that you have to turn on to where it charges over USB-C when you're plugged into the computer. And apparently I didn't turn that on. So anyway, we've got a fresh battery. We're back online. Appreciate everybody's patience. I am one of these days, I swear, I'll get this camera thing figured out. I swear. Okay, getting back to where we are. Um, I was responding to superheat measurement. That's right. So the superheat measurement uh, within six inches, that is one great thing about the, uh, the Bluetooth gauges or measurement tools is, uh, you know, you, you can just put it on there. You know, maybe you just pull the, the condenser fan shroud up a little bit, reach down there and clip it on, and you can get that reading uh, relatively easily that way. Um, I, yeah, it, it was a pain, especially if you're still using wired probes. You know, I remember what I used to do uh, is, yeah, you'd get in there, clamp it, and then you'd try to feed the wire back up through like the liquid line or suction line, you know, cutouts. You know, just, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm training with that measurement because it is a very useful measurement when you can take it. I'm, I'm not going to waste too much time on it. Uh... Let's see, if heat is on there, is there no way a 20 degree drop occurs? If heat is on there, is there no way? Yeah, you, you go back to that on the heater on. You just oh, oh, okay, yes, 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 you are correct, Bill. Um, yes, I would not expect, unless, unless you're somehow reading the supply or the, the leaving air before the heater, which some systems you can do, especially if you're dealing with um, uh, commercial RTUs. You know, you can get a supply air that's pre-heater and you might not ever see that, uh, that temperature. So that, that is possible, but 
Yeah, when you're doing it from the ductwork, you wouldn't see that. Uh, discharge gas temp, leaving the compressor minus your super C, I believe. Yes, yes, uh, Michael is correct. You're, um, you're taking your discharge temperature minus your discharge saturation. Now, that's for discharge superheat. Now, there's a caveat to this is most of the time we're reading our liquid line uh, pressure, which is where we're getting our saturation from. Uh, these coils have some pressure drop across them. So most of the time, it's only a couple of degrees of variance, but just something to think about, especially if you're trying to take a very sensitive or critical reading, is the discharge saturation actually on the compressor discharge line is a little different than the liquid line. They're not exactly the same, unless you're dealing with like a shell and tube. So if you've got a self-contained, like a a train, for example, you've got a self-contained, or even the Dikens now, an SWP system where uh, there's a, the, the refrigerant goes through a shell. Shells actually lose next to no pressure drop across them. You might have one PSI if that. It's when you're dealing with a coil that you're going to see that pressure drop uh, be significantly or have a significant impact in your readings. Uh, let's see, what could be the reason of high suction superheat? So we'll get into some of those. Uh, I don't, I need to get moving on time here. I got at least two more examples I want to work through. Uh, thank you, discharge. Temperature should stay under about 225 to prevent oil breakdown, FYI. Yes, and that is, so 225 is the like critical failure point for a compressor, but you know, typically your compressor shouldn't be, especially like scrolls, they really shouldn't be exceeding, you know, 60 plus degrees of, of, uh, of uh, discharge superheat. Uh, they, they ought to be able to maintain below that if everything's working properly. Now, we get into some other compressors like centrifugals or screws, we don't even let them run that high. We run those even lower than that. But... Um, you know, just because you're below the 225 doesn't mean that that discharge superheat isn't helping indicate to you what's going on in the system and how much cooling it's able to receive. And I talked about it before, you know, you could have a high discharge superheat from a contactor or an input voltage issue. Your, your, your suction superheat may be perfectly fine and accurate, but you know, because the compressor is generating a lot of additional electrical heat, or let's say the bearings are having an issue, maybe it's got an oil problem. And so because of those internal issues, it's gonna generate more heat inside the compressor, and that additional heat is gonna be represented in our discharge superheat uh, being high, even though our suction superheat is appropriate. And we may not have elevated head pressures. So those are things to to look at and think about and how to use that reading to really benefit you. Uh, let's see, let me catch back up here. That's when you get uh, parts. <laughs> uh, he's funny, you're funny. <laughs> I'll call you later. <laughs> Okay, next example. Let's move on here. Uh, da, 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 da. So we're going to go 50 EVAP in a 10 degree superheat. Uh, we're going to go uh, 110 and 10 on the condenser. And 10. Then our, uh, oh, our complaint. Our complaint is not cooling, by the way. Um, our return and supply. Uh, make these. We got 80. 65. And 60 on the relative. Okay. Oh, my discharge superheat is 50. Yeah, 50. Okay. 
These are your readings. So that's your complaint. Your complaint is the system is not cooling. We can see that by our elevated return air temperature. We also see that our supply air doesn't look all that fantastic either. We have an elevated relative humidity, but at the same time, if we're having cooling issues to begin with, our, our humidity being high honestly makes a lot of sense regardless. Uh, now we do see our 50 degree saturation, so I would consider that you know to be elevated. Uh, but superheat looks you know okay, subcool looks okay, saturation on condenser looks interesting, and so does my discharge superheat. My outside air temperature has not changed. We're going to keep it at 100 throughout this exercise. What do we think? What do we think? Uh, da, 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 da. The size of coil, the equal higher pressure drop, uh, or uh, see self-contained package unit water. I don't think that would be that. I don't, I don't know what the heck he was talking about either. Maybe inflow of PSI. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so is there was a kind of while everybody's processing the example behind me, uh, I want to scroll back real quick. There was a question about um, uh, I didn't know. Yeah, so self-contains. So self-contained, I'm learning is a local term for here, uh, or at least it seems like it sometimes. So if, in the actual literature, if you pull it up and read it, it actually says self-contained on like the IOM and such. So that, uh, that's where we kind of pull that term from. But essentially, it's a big air handler. Uh, they can range from 40 tons up to 80 to 100 tons. And... Uh, you, a lot of times you'll have one per wing of the building. You'll have one self-contained per floor. Just kind of depends on the size in the building. Anyway, you've got a DX evaporator in the back. You'll have your blower, uh, you know, there in the main cabinet. Uh, and then underneath the whole assembly, basically under, in between, or the blower and coil section sit on top of another platform, and that lower platform is where your condenser, your water-cooled condensers are, and compressors. So it's 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 not a heat pump or anything of that nature. It doesn't have reverse flow, and these are very large systems. So typically, you know, your water source heat pumps are only a few tons at best. You know, maybe five, ten tons. Yeah, I, I think they can get up to. Uh, more than that in, in some like large cases, but vast majority of the time, there may be five tons. So in this particular case, these are actual, like these are large design systems to where you can process uh, an entire wing or an entire floor of the building and just we water cool the condenser and send it to a cooling tower instead of having remote condensers or such. Let's see. In the new, let's see, da, 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 da. heat pump or straight air? Uh, all of these are straight, no, no heat pump in these examples. The condenser, SOL. Uh, so you're seeing a problem with the condenser. Uh, what do you think the uh, condensers going? Condenser split too little. Ten? Yes. Okay. So. What would be so? What would be the diagnosis? Are you are you condemning the condenser coil, or what issue are you trying to hone in on for the condenser? So remember, you know, if, if we're if we're struggling to identify what it is, let's start working through our list of probabilities. So do we go to an overcharge? Okay, so we just dealt with an example like that. We have a very similar. Uh, evap saturation is elevated. We see we have a high relative humidity, but we're not controlling the space as well. So, you know, what if we have, are we overfeeding? Why is our saturation so high? 
Uh, well, overcharge, I think we can take it back to, we have a normal subcooling at 10 degrees and our condenser saturation, I would be considered to be low, okay? Ultimately, 10 degrees, even on modern systems, while some of them can do it with a really light load, typically with a 100 degree day and a full load on the system, you're not gonna run only 10 degrees on the condenser. It's gonna be more than that. So I would consider that one Q of an indicator. Um, let's see, can, could be dirty, the condenser could be dirty, okay? So if we're talking about a, uh, yeah, a good condenser airflow, okay. So we're, we're concerned with the condenser coil or the condenser airflow. So if we have poor airflow or if we have uh, a poor, con like a, a condenser that's in bad shape and maybe it's got issues with it's been just corroded all heck and it's just got problems but either way. What do we expect? Well, we expect our heat exchange capability, our ability to move heat through the coil to go up or go down. Uh, I would expect it to go down which means that I would expect my condenser saturation to go up. I would expect a spike out of that condenser because of its uh, just lack of ability to maintain that. Like it's, it's running too hot, or it would be running hot. So that would be the first thing I'd look at if I'm trying to evaluate condenser coil or condenser fan issue. What is my saturation doing? If I'm running low, then I'm not worried about heat exchange because keep in mind, um, we can't move too much air, right? We can't overcool the condenser coil per se, you know, with a, amp and we're not talking low ambient stuff here. So, because we're not dealing with uh, latent heat, we're not dealing with the humidity piece of it. We're only having to deal with the sensible portion of the heat. So temperature is the only thing that's really affecting any of our heat exchange. Uh, discharge gas bypassing into the low side, okay? So the only place that could be possible would be internal on the compressor. Um, so what would that be considered? Why would that be the case? Uh, help me work through that. You know, what's, what's your thought process there? Uh, yeah, I'm curious to get some more input on that. What's your, what's your thought process on the discharge gas bypassing into the low side? Let's get some feedback while you're working on that. You know, what are some other possible solutions? Um, is it low on charge? You know, that's a common thing. You know, do we, are we dealing with a low charge? I think a low charge is pretty easy to eliminate just based off of the fact we've got a 10 degree subcool and a 10 degree superheat. I mean, it's simple enough, right? 10 and 10, we're not freezing on the evaporator. You know, we know if we got a low charge, that's gonna be down really low. That's not the case, so we could probably rule that out. Um, bad valves or a heat pump, okay. So we don't have heat pump, so there's no reversing valve to get stuck or create any kind of a bypassing issue, so I'm not worried about that. Um, let's see, bad valves, okay, well we got a scroll, so you have a relief valve inside of the scroll, but that's probably not the, the issue there, I wouldn't, you know, scrolls, don't, you don't have the same valves. So I'm being really technical there and kind of re real nitpicky. I can get the overall gist of what you're saying, uh, but I do really challenge just our verbiage on so, some stuff like that. I'd really encourage, uh, um, yeah. Oh yes, sorry, scroll. All of these examples are, are scroll based. Everything we're doing, TXV, scroll, straight cool, standard efficiency. None of this is anything fancy or high end. But my goal is not to troubleshoot that, it's to troubleshoot the process of getting to the solution. Uh, so West, did you say what refrigerant we were using or just assuming 410A? I did not say what refrigerant we were using. Uh, I can give you a refrigerant if you want to. So let's say 410A, but I follow that up with does it matter? Does refrigerant in these examples matter whatsoever? You can make an argument that with blends, they could matter to a certain degree. So I'll give you that. 
you know, if, if it was a blended refrigerant and you uh, fractionated, you can make an argument that, well, yeah, it does matter the refrigerant, but beyond that specific thing, uh, does it matter? And why? I'd like to see some feedback on that. Uh, is that, is it bad that I don't really see what an issue with the numbers? Uh, except the low head pressure. Let's see, miss the scroll, oversized condenser. Okay, so we have an oversized condenser, which means we're moving more heat than we ought to be able to. I mean, so, uh, okay, 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 you know what, let's chase it, okay, no. Let's not rule it out. Oversized condenser. I, I see. I see where you're going there. Okay. Condenser coil is really big. We're able to reject a way too much heat, and we've got a really low uh, delta on our condenser saturation, and our subcooling is, you know, maintaining as expected. So we're only 100 degrees outside. So our liquid line temperature can only get down to ambient anyway. So it can't go any lower. We're gonna go through our system. Now what might start to challenge our process is, okay, well, why are we running 50 degrees? Do we have multiple issues going on here? That's, so let's, you know, if we, sometimes that can get real confusing. You could have a problem on the outdoor and the indoor, and the two problems are stacking on top of each other, and it's making the whole thing look like bowl of spaghetti. So, Okay, do we need to now, do we condemn this for the wrong condenser? Did somebody change it out, get the wrong part by mistake? And then did, uh, why, why do we have such a high saturation? But at the same time, with this kind of saturation and 10 degrees of superheat, why are we running an 80 degree return air? Why are we struggling to make proper supply air? And why is our discharge superheat 50? So, okay, with that in mind, how does this make sense? What do we do with those numbers? You know, this could indicate too much airflow, okay? A lower split, that would make sense, right? So you're moving a lot of air really fast. You can't properly get the split you're looking for. That's going to raise your uh, humidity, but you're still only moving 10 degrees of superheat and you've got a low condenser saturation. So if you're moving a whole lot of BTUs at one time, I got, even with an oversized coil, I would expect something more out of the condenser. Maybe not, maybe it's really that, that much oversized. But then why is my discharge superheat 50 when that seems high for my conditions, especially with a low condenser saturation, I don't have a high compression ratio. So why would my superheat on the condenser or my compressor be so high? That's, that would be my challenge. Like, how do I answer that question? Uh, busted return air duct pulling in attic air. Okay. Uh, okay, yep, yep, yep. Uh, so it's pulling in attic air and you have uh, too much, so you have a high airflow and you're pulling in attic air. That would be your combination to make this make a little more sense. Okay, okay. And the reason I say too much airflow is we get back to the, you know, only 15 degrees there. So, okay, Poss possible, absolutely possible, you are correct. That's not the problem though, because you go up to the air, to the attic, and you do an inspection of the duct system and you don't find any leaks, and you don't find anything to indicate to you that there's a problem with the airstream in the ductwork. So your readings turn into a physical assessment. Your physical assessment proves that that theory is false for this specific troubleshoot. But given these conditions, I agree with you. Do, 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 do. The return air is too high. Why compressor discharge is high? Suction line restricted after the service port, maybe? Suction line restricted after the service port. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Uh, I see where you're going. Um, we just talked about that too, where you would see, you know, we, I use the discharge superheat being low as an example of why that wasn't the case. So at this particular time, we've got something. So there's no suction line dryer. I'll just say that there's no dryer. There's nothing of that nature in the system. Um, so you would have just something in the pipe. You'd have some kind of piece of trash get in the pipe. I, that'd be a really weird situation. Um, the only thing you could do for that, like if, you, if that was going to be your diagnosis, would honestly be to cut that section of pipe out and inspect it. You really wouldn't have too many other options. I wouldn't, that would be a very difficult recommendation to make to the customer. Uh, I types. Uh, yeah, but the attic air has hot, humid, so you lose some delta. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm not trying to make this overly complicated. So, me walking through this, you know, we've ruled out overcharge, undercharge. We've ruled out um, several options, honestly, and. Uh, we've got some really good input on this one. This is one of those. Honestly, this is probably one of the most misdiagnosed. One of the most. I'm not saying it's the most, but one of the most misdiagnosed and one of the most difficult uh, troubleshoots, obviously. It's, it's not very easy. Low saturation. High saturation. High discharge superheat. We don't have any conditions here to cause concern. Our dryer is clear. Our, our metering device appears to be functioning fine. What you didn't realize is this compressor, and you may not be able to catch this on site. This may be something that if you didn't just right place, right time, you'd you might never know. But this compressor is overheating and tripping on internal thermal overload every couple hours. And so you've got 30 minutes or so of time that it wants to be running or it needs to be that it can, which is allowing heat to stack in the space. Also, we're, we've, got a low, we've got a low compression ratio overall. It may not be dramatic, may not be dramatic. A lot of times they're not. And that's actually some feedback I got after the last time I gave this example was, well, it wasn't a super dramatic one. Like when I've, when I've caught these compressors being inefficient in the past, it's usually been really dramatic. Well, that's probably why you were able to catch it is because it was dramatic. And that's not a shot against nobody. The point is, this is not an easy troubleshoot and condemning a compressor should be one of the last things we, uh, we ultimately want to do. But... That would be, in my opinion, the proper diagnosis here. And this is one of those where it's, it's hard because like you want to, it pulls you several directions. And that's one of the things that inefficient compressor will do. It pulls you several directions on what it could be when ultimately the compressor can't move the proper volume of refrigerant, which brings your head pressure down. You can still make subcooling. It brings your saturation up because you're not pulling it as fast, but you can still make superheat. What you don't know is how often is it tripping out on internal overload or thermal, um, which that high discharge superheat can help you identify, why am I running such high? Why, why, is, it, why is it like that? Why? Uh, it's a challenging one. Why the heck is it overheating though? If you got 60 degree gas coming back to the compressor, switch uh, weaken over time. It's possible that the thermal switch could weaken, but ultimately you gotta think, just because your superheat is coming back at a proper temperature, doesn't mean that the volume of the refrigerant that it needs at that temperature. You basically, you, you slow down your airflow through your compressor. Think of it, if that makes any sense at all, you know, so you, so your your ability to remove that heat at an appropriate rate 
is reduced. And it's not tripping every, like constantly. And say you, this, the call like this, you're there for 30 minutes to an hour looking at these readings, trying to interpret it. And it's able to run that whole time. What you didn't know is it just turned back on five, 10 minutes before you walked up to it. And you give it an hour and you're really not sure, and, hey, I need to come back with somebody, you know, who more experienced than me. And 20 minutes after you leave, it trips back out. So, and then that happens. It, I mean, it genuinely works out that way. So we, that's the kind of stuff that, again, right place, right time. This is, these are hard things to work through. They're hard things. Uh, but yes, because your total volume of refrigerant reduces, even though it's the right temperature, doesn't mean it's actually enough to keep that compressor cool enough. And, and inevitably that heat just builds up enough. And yeah, you get a weak thermal limit internally and it only goes downhill faster further. Okay. <sighs> Let's see. Ble <laughs> so you're bleeding through. So with the scroll, with the scroll, um, the actual plates, the seals, and the, like that, it's got a, a seal in there that mates to the top of the discharge housing inside the scroll. A lot of times that, and then between the plates, those things will begin to show mechanical wear, they'll wear down. And that's a lot of times where that inefficient compression be becomes because it, it ends up bypassing right there at the scroll assembly. The only valve inside of a scroll, and I'm being super technical and super picky here, I understand, but the only valve is your relief valve from the head to the suction belly. Uh, could be covered in dirt or maybe going bad cap. Uh, talking about the condenser west, covered in dirt, the condenser be covered in dirt? Uh, or are you talking about the temperature sensor? Okay, so if you're talking about the temp sensor, the temp sensor we're referencing is an internal sensor in the compressor windings. It would not be exposed to uh, atmosphere or air or anything else. It wouldn't be exposed to dirt to begin with. Uh, yep, back to work. Yeah, I got to wrap up here myself. I got some calls I got to run this afternoon, so keep an eye on the contactor. If you want to see it pulled in, no compressor running, there's a hint. Yes, absolutely. Yep, your contactor's pulled. Now, keep in mind, though, what's, what's hard about that is three-phase. So three-phase, it's going to react a little different. Now, this example I'm talking about, honestly, yes, this would be a single-phase example. Uh, but three-phase, you know, we don't, it, it's, it's a little different. So don't let that, don't let that get you. But yes, contactor pulls in, compressor no run. Maybe something wrong with compressor. Uh, wouldn't the symptoms appear with a scroll if it lacks oil on the scroll assembly, can't properly seal? Yes, Archer. Um, yes is the short answer. And it's hard. It's hard to do that with a lot of regular scrolls because most of the time you only get sight glasses on the big ones. Uh, or So, yeah, it can be really difficult working through oil issues um, with, uh, with, the, with any kind of scroll compressor like that. But, you know, so dealing with, let's say that was true and you were, it was a, loss of oil in the in the basin of the compressor somehow had oil somewhere in the system uh but everything we see here you know just yeah then you then you're diving into why are we either migrating or stacking oil somewhere else was the compressor flooding see that may be the other thing about it you don't know the compressor was flooding for a long time and it wore down the bearings it flushed the oil out of the compressor did a whole bunch of damage in the process. And by the time anybody knew what was going on and you get to it, this is the conditions you see. Because it can't, com it can't compress and pump like it's supposed to anymore. So you're not going to have that same kind of uh, superheat subcool issues you had prior. 
but by the time you put this new compressor in and you go to start it up, then you get into the second phase of your troubleshoot, which is why did the first compressor fail? And I would have that question at any point. You lose a compressor. I, I've talked about this heavily. You lose a compressor. Your first phase of your troubleshoot process is, is the compressor bad? Once you've got that far, your very next phase, your, your, it goes in, you know, after it's changed out, you know, your next phase of that process is what took it out? You know, yes, compressor failures can happen. But my opinion, that shouldn't be the rule of thumb. You should always treat every compressor as something killed it, ultimately. And it is rare, in my opinion, that compressors just fail on their own. They're almost always failed by something else. Even if it's something minor, that's not super obvious when you get in there and you start working and dealing and trying to work through stuff. Y'all get back to work. I'll see y'all in a couple of weeks. Hope you enjoyed it. There was one more I wanted to dive into, but uh, we'll have to save that for another day.